Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's National History Day workshop. Um, this is actually a true National History Day workshop and not just a history education workshop, because today we'll be talking about the 2022 National History Day in Arizona theme. So just a little bit of a reminder and some introductions before we get started. My name is Janie Adams, and I'm the Curator of Education. I'm also a staff historian for the Arizona Historical Society, and perhaps most importantly for today's meeting, I am the Arizona Affiliate National History Day Coordinator. I'm based out of Tucson, uh, really passionate about history and local history and history education, and I'm really excited to be with you today. Also joining us is Allison Avery, who is based out of Tempe, also with the Historical Society, also a curator of education, and Allison is going to be helping me run the uh, Central Arizona Regional Contest in the spring. Okay, so Let's talk a little bit, uh, this presentation kind of has three major parts. The first major part is talking about the National History Day theme very generally. So why does National History Day have a theme? Um, what's the purpose of the theme? Things like that. The second part, we're gonna talk about what the theme for 2022 actually is. And then the third section of the presentation, we'll kind of walk through some ideas for how to go from all of your personal interests as a human being and also as a historian to concrete research questions that you can explore when you start doing your primary and your secondary research. So a little bit about the National History Day theme kind of general. The theme is absolutely key to your project. So this is some uh, text from National History Day. It says the theme provides a focused way to increase students' historical understanding by developing a lens to read history, an organizational structure that helps students place information in the correct context, and finally, the ability to see connections over time. So the theme is really the lens with which you will be looking at historical events. So your project must relate to the annual theme and your argument that your topic relates to the annual theme must be convincing. Uh, it's really important that you remember that there are no obvious choices. I think last year's theme is a really good example of that. And I think I said this in an, in an earlier presentation, but last year's theme was communication and history. And so you can't just have done your project on Alexander Graham Bell and assume that your audience would have agreed with you that Alexander Graham Bell is the father of modern communication. You, as the expert, need to unpack that for the audience and you need to make a convincing and compelling persuasive argument that your topic relates to the annual theme. So sometimes the annual theme is a little more abstract and sometimes the annual theme is a little bit more obvious. And, and what I mean by obvious, we'll kind of unpack a little bit. So consider the 2019 theme. So in 2019, the theme for National History Day was breaking barriers in history. I think that that was kind of confusing for a lot of students. Um, one, because we really have to interrogate this question, is the first person really the person who broke the barrier? Are they actually breaking a barrier? Or are they rather um, participating within a power structure that benefits them? Um, and then you also need to define what is the barrier, right? With this one, you could be very literal. I remember some students wrote their projects literally about the Berlin Wall or about military blockades, right? Physical, actual barriers. Other students went kind of more metaphorical and thought about uh, the color line or gender discrimination. So it's really up to you, regardless of what the theme is, it's really up to you to tell us what you mean. As the expert, you get to tell us what you mean. So take the opportunity to do so. So in this example from 2019, in your process paper and also in the introductory section of your project, you need to explain to us what you mean by a barrier, for example. So this theme was a little bit more abstract. Um, the theme for 2022 is a little bit more concrete, um, a little less kind of, I keep wanting to say metaphysical, but that's not the word that I want, but it's a little less ephemeral. It's a little less uh, up to imagination. Okay, so this is a really quick note about being the expert and about defining terms, 
right? So there are historical concepts and terminology, and then there's jargon. So historical concepts and terms like manifest destiny, for example, tell the reader that you understand the body of work that came before you and that your work is in conversation with other historians who have worked on the same topic. So all, really all history is, is different individuals coming from a different political location, right? Political location, meaning um, all of the parts of their identities and where they fall. So their gender representation, their race or ethnicity, their religious background, their educational background, all of those things matter. And all of those things impact the kinds of historians that we become. So all different historians are writing on the same topic, right? All different historians are writing on uh, Pearl Harbor, for example. So your work is among those historians and historians kind of comment on the works of other historians and say, this is what I got out of this piece. This is what I think is missing. This is what I agree with. This is what I want to tweak. So it's really important that your piece kind of be in conversation with other experts on the topic. Remember to define and remember to cite, right? So if you're using a concept and you want to tweak the meaning, you have to give us that definition. And if you're pointing at a concept that another historian uh, kind of coined or came up with, you want to make sure that you cite that other person. So those are kind of terms and concepts. Jargon, on the other hand, is a totally completely different thing. So jargon is language that a specific field of study uses that is difficult for outsiders to understand. So if you have a complicated historical idea, and I've kind of pulled this one um, from, from research, uh, discursive, discursively imbricated ontologies, which is basically like overlapping, digressing ways of being, essentially is how you would translate that sentence. Um, if you're gonna use a really kind of dense or not common language, the common vernacular term for something, you wanna unpack that term a little bit for your audience because your audience is historians, it's professors, it's your teachers, but your audience is also the general public. And so it's really important to remember that when you're kind of using these um, SAT words, these six million dollar words in your project. And so I wanted to give an example of what I mean by that. So this is a quotation from the introduction to one of my favorite books, one of my favorite history monographs, um, Power Lines by Andrew Needham. And this book is about Phoenix and the history of Phoenix. And so I just included this section because I wanted to show to you how historians link back to the works of other historians. And sometimes you need to be in the know to know those linkages. But you can always see quotation marks are going to be a dead giveaway that this is a concept from someone else. Crabgrass Frontier is a very like well-known concept in this particular field of study. Um, edge cities, life on the new frontier. So you see quotation marks and you also see the footnote superscript. So those are all really good indicators that these are borrowed concepts. And if you were to go to note six, you would see all of the citations for all of those different concepts. So this historian is in conversation with all of those other historians and their work adds to that conversation. They don't necessarily have to agree with the work of the historians that came before them, but they do have to be in conversation with those historians. All right, so pivoting back from kind of this digression about jargon to the National History Day theme. So you can't just mention the annual theme in your process paper or in your introduction. You need to actually weave the connection to the annual theme all the way through your paper. So I've included this rubric section from the evaluation form that all judges get when they get your projects. Now, this evaluation form is new last year and it's undergoing some tweaks. So once we kind of have those changes in hand and we have a sense of what we're looking at, we'll have a presentation, a presentation for teachers and also one for students about how to use the rubric and the judges evaluation to your credit to help you guide your thinking as a historian. So if we look here and we see historical quality, which is 80% of the value of our project, we see this section for historical argument. 
And the thing that they're evaluating for historical argument is two part. One, that you have a historical argument that is well formulated and it's supported by analysis of your primary and secondary sources. And the second part is that you're that you're weaving the annual theme all the way through your project. So if we look at that, we see a superior project weaves the annual theme all the way through their project. An excellent project addresses the annual theme in their project. A good uh, project mentions the annual theme. And in a fair project, the annual theme is unclear. Now, it's really important that you just don't kind of riff and go off on your own because then you won't receive a score at all, right? You really wanna to try to connect your project to the annual theme as much as possible. Uh, one, because it does give you that lens for discovering and exploring the past. The past is wide and deep and vast. And so to have that lens to help shape your conversation would be really helpful, right? There are lots of things to look at. So if we have one kind of facet that we're looking at, we can actually get to the bottom of a historical problem that we're trying to address. Okay, so that's kind of all that I had about themes in general and why National History Day uses the theme. Now, if you're following along at home and you're filling out your roadmap, the secret code word for today's session is Parker. So make sure to include that on your roadmap. And if you turn your roadmap in to the National History Day in Arizona email address, nhdaz at azhs.gov, on or before December 1st, 2021, and you've attended at least seven of these sessions, we will go ahead and we will give you a little treat and recognize you at the state conference. So the secret code word for today's session is Parker. All right, so on to the theme for 2022. The National History Day in Arizona theme for 2022 is debate and diplomacy in history, successes, failures, and consequences. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what is a debate? What is diplomacy? How do we determine success, failure, and consequence? And some other things to take into consideration before we even start thinking about topics. All right, so National History Day puts together a whole host of theme resources, and you can access all of those resources on nhd.org slash theme, including the theme video, which is very, very important, the theme booklet, incredibly important. And also two weeks ago, National History Day had a Q&A where they took questions from students about the theme. And a lot of the questions I think are questions that all of us have. And that video is about an hour long. So if you've got about an hour to watch this presentation, I would really encourage you to watch the Q&A session on the 2022 theme from National History Day. Okay, so what is debate? According to National History Day, Debates are often formal or informal meetings where people argue opposing views. Uh, remember from last workshop, argue does not always mean that they have a fight. Argue sometimes means that they present convincing um, interpretations of their side, right? So sometimes we have people yelling at each other. Sometimes we have something a little with a little bit more decorum. So it's important to remember that. Some debates have two sides, while others involve three or more perspectives. And there are all kinds of debates. You've got political debates like presidential debates before the election or debates over laws, or there are also cultural debates like reactionary changes to fashion, right? Uh, women cutting their hair short, um, you know, clothes being a certain color to kind of defy some monarch, for example. Those are all reactionary changes to fashion that can be debates. And then the other side of that, what is diplomacy? So National History Day defines diplomacy as uh, negotiating, compromising, and communicating with people or nations to find a nonviolent solution to a perceived problem. So treaties, diplomatic trips, spreading goodwill are all kinds of traditional forms of diplomacy. Uh, and these construct or maintain alliances between nations or communities or individuals. But there's also non-traditional diplomacy. And uh, increasingly as our society has these like non-nation entities like major corporations, um, 
these non-traditional forms of diplomacy are going to become increasingly popular. So think about health diplomacy or science diplomacy. So successes, failures, and consequences. That's the other part of the theme, the kind of subtitle. And some things to keep in mind is, are diplomatic and debate successes always and forever successes? Sometimes things change, right? So something can appear like a success right after the occurrence of the event, but maybe 50 years later when we're reflecting on it, we go, ooh, maybe, maybe this was not a winner, right? Or on the other hand, there can be a diplomatic action that looks like a complete failure at the time, right? Like let's say um, a diplomat spills their soup all over the president of a foreign nation, right? Like, ooh, that's not good. But maybe in the future, when we evaluate that event, we go, actually, you know what? It showed that these two, um, these two kind of officials are just human beings and they had a good laugh about it and it was all good, right? So debate and diplomacy are like chess, right? There's the battle, the individual conflict. And then there's the war, the kind of series of interactions that happen together. And just because you win the battle doesn't mean that you're going to win the war. And just because you've won the war doesn't mean that you've won every battle. And so I kind of wanted to show this TikTok just for some levity to kind of think about chess and think about uh, sacrifice, right? Sometimes we have to sacrifice a pawn in order to move forward. So let's my move all right let's see. once i make my move then you're free to check the king no Ron, no what is it he's going to sacrifice himself no you can't there must be another way do you want to stop snake from getting that stone or not harry it's you that has to go on i know it not me not hermione yo once I'm <laughs> okay, so that's kind of a silly example, but you can see thinking about sacrificing individual pawns. It can be a big sacrifice at the time, but ultimately it's better for kind of the entire game, right? So sometimes we have, sometimes we will intentionally lose a debate to further our point in the future, right? So sometimes that happens in history and in history. So some questions when we're thinking about debate and diplomacy and we're considering perspective and uh, different voices, right? So does everyone have a seat at the negotiating table? And maybe if they do, do all those seats have the same weight, right? Like I'm always thinking about um, that conversation after the First World War where, you know, Germany wasn't even allowed to be at the negotiating table, right? So how does that change the kinds of diplomatic measures that come out of that meeting? Who, which voices are missing from this conversation, right? Are women excluded? Are people of color excluded? Are people uh, with certain levels of education excluded? And then the other side of that is who is being spoken for and did they appoint that person or group to speak for them? Think about kind of during the debate over women's suffrage, right? So lots of men were called upon to be kind of the political and moral guidance of their families, but did their wives and children trust them to do that or entrust them to? And then there's this question of nonviolent, right? National History Day defines diplomacy as nonviolent. But who gets to say what is and what is not violence, right? So think about um, family separations and treaties with Native Americans where um, families were separated and children were sent to boarding schools. This is an ongoing kind of historical debate that we're seeing. Who gets to decide what violence looks like? Is it bloodshed or is it something? psychological. And so those are all really important questions to keep in mind when we're thinking about debate and diplomacy. All right, do you have to cover both debate and diplomacy? Well, technically the answer is no. You can choose a topic that is more debate or a topic that is more diplomacy, 
But what you will probably find during your research is that the two are intertwined. It might not be a 50-50 split, but it's really important that if connections between debate and diplomacy arise, that we don't ignore them, right? That we consider the impact that diplomacy has on debate and vice versa. Uh, just really important though, if you are focusing specifically on a debate, for example, make sure you let the judges know that in your process paper and then in the introductory section of your project. It's really important that you never leave the judges guessing. Judges are human too, and sometimes they get confused. So it's just better to kind of preempt that struggle completely and just say, my project, my project focuses on this debate. Boom, perfect. So national debates in local communities. I'm sure you've heard this kind of turn of phrase, all politics is local. Right? A nation is built up of continuously smaller communities, and each community is unique and has different wants and needs and histories. National debates and international diplomacy affect all of us. It might not affect all of us equally, but it affects all of us. So sometimes our elected officials are called upon to make big decisions on our behalf, or sometimes it's our identity communities that are affected, like women, people of color, certain religious groups. So think about, does this national or international event have a local story? And how can I tell that local story? How can I explore that local story as a microcosm for a much larger event? When does a topic become historical? I think this is always a tricky question. And when someone asks this question, it's really important that we tease out the questions that they're actually trying to ask. And the question that they're actually trying to ask is, can you tell us the historical significance of this event? So some people would say that an event has to be 50 years old to get a sense of the historical consequences of that event. So an event has to have occurred before 1971 in order to be considered historical. But we know that recent events, there are recent events that are undeniably historical events like 9-11, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Fukushima disaster. So it's really up to you as the expert to articulate the historical significance of an event. But I would give you a piece of, of advice. There are lots of debates that we are seeing today that are also debates of the past like abortion, indigenous land rights, voting rights, and you can absolutely explore an event that looks like a present day event for your topic. But I would encourage you to ask yourself, how did we get here? How did we get to this debate in 2021? And then trace that debate backwards in time and see if you can find a route for that debate or a route to that diplomatic effort. And then that might be something that you can more easily articulate the historical significance of because you can connect it to the present. We're still waiting to see how some of these, in, these events unfold and we're seeing the immediate impact of some of these present day debates, but only time will tell the long ranging impacts of these debates. All right, so a quick additional note about debates about human, civil and legal rights. It is very important that if you wanna do your project on human, civil, or legal rights, that you do not debate if one group or person deserves those rights or not. We are not, as historians, engaging in the debate here, but what we are doing is exploring the history of these debates in context, and considering the long-ranging influences on similar debates that are happening today where applicable. So it's always really important to remember that we study the past to build empathy. So, you know, if we're arguing that certain people don't deserve certain rights, that's not really empathetic of us, right? These debates impact people every day. And so it's really important that if we're looking at debates over rights, that we're not debating whether or not people deserve rights but we are debate or we are looking at the historical debates on why people agreed or disagreed at that time in context. 
All right, so let's get started. So how do I go from all of my ideas, all of my interests to a working thesis? That can always be really scary, right? How do I pick a topic that makes sense? How do I pick a topic that is easy to convey the historical significance of or easy to connect to the annual theme? So I would encourage you to start by getting all of your ideas on paper. And I've created these kinds of two lists, right? So I've got a list of my personal interests, my hobbies, the things that I am nerdy about, whatever, and then a list of my historical interests. And then try to see where those things cross over. So if we look here, I've highlighted some of these ideas, right? So maybe I'm really interested in sports. Maybe there's a particular sport that I'm really interested in. And then let's say I'm also really interested, my historical interests, my research interests are the progressive era, which is that period from the late 1800s to the early 1900s where lots of social reforms were occurring, or maybe my interests are women's history. So from the topics I've highlighted above, maybe I wanna do my project on the Equal Rights Amendment. Or maybe I want to do my project on Title IX, right? Why can't women or why don't traditionally women play baseball? If you need help coming up with ideas, talk with your teacher, talk with a librarian, or you can reach out to me. Uh, I can connect you to someone who, if I don't have an idea, I can connect you to someone who does, and we can help you brainstorm those ideas. It's also really important that if you create one of these lists, of your personal interests and your historical interests that you hang on to your list. You might find that when you start reading, you hit a dead end and that's okay, that's part of the process. But if you hang on to your list, you have a backup plan. Okay, so I like to call this the theme to research question funnel. And you've got two examples here based on last year's theme. So the theme for last year was communication and history, the key to understanding. And let's say my general research interest is women's history. Women's history is such a big topic, right? We haven't even said Americans women's history. We're just saying women's history generally. But even if we were to say US women's history, we have to think about class and we have to think about race and we have to think about region. All of these different things are coming together. So we need to go from our general interest and narrow it down just a little bit more to our broad topic, right? So for example, this person has said, okay, well, maybe I'm interested specifically in women's voting rights. Again, that's a huge topic. Women have been fighting for the right to vote since voting was a concept. So how do we kind of distill a researchable question from that really big idea? And they go, okay, you're right. Women's history, women's voting history is a really big topic. So what if we looked specifically at the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention? That is an event. A singular event is a little bit easier to research because there are perimeters on kind of when and where things are happening. But even that is too big of a topic, right? We need to even think smaller from the Seneca Falls Convention. And that's where your research questions fall in. So this person said, well, why did this convention even happen? It's always good to start with, well, why? Why did we need to do this? Why did we need to take this extra measure? What happened at the Seneca Falls Convention? What was the impact of the convention? And then how did different groups think about the convention, right? During the Seneca Falls Convention, we start to see that split between Anglo-American feminists and uh, Black American feminists. Remember that this is before the American Civil War. And so people are, are talking about feminism and abolition and women's suffrage all happening at the same time. And that's really starting to show divisions within this kind of sisterhood concept, right? So these are good research questions to start thinking about the kinds of materials, the kinds of sources that you're interested in. Same thing with this funnel over here about racial equality, right? So racial equality is a huge topic. Even the US civil rights movement is a huge topic, right? We're coming to find out that the civil rights movement is much longer in time than I think a lot of us were, or a lot of us originally considered, right? When we think about the civil rights movement, sometimes we really only think about the 1960s, but this is a struggle that's happening since the civil war. 
and way past the passage of the Civil Rights Act, right? So we're looking at a huge chunk of time. So we need to maybe pick one event, one topic, one kind of concept from the US Civil Rights Movement to guide our paper. paper. And, and this student has cho chosen the Montgomery bus boycott. Again, why did the boycott happen? How was it organized? What did it achieve? And who were the main people or groups involved? And how did they feel about this? Remember that multiple perspective piece is going to be incredibly important. So these research questions, however, they're a good starting point. These ones are not particularly compelling, right? If you were to read a whole book on why the Seneca Falls Convention happened, I think that that you would be kind of missing some larger pieces. And that's where that connection to the annual theme comes in. And that's where your lenses become incredibly important to help you tell one really compelling story. So I'll need to write an interesting thesis to really level up my research questions. And don't forget that next Saturday, September 11th, we're having a thesis writing workshop where you can do just that. You can go from your kind of general ideas to your research question to an actual working thesis that'll help you guide your research. And so I've kind of replicated these um, funnels here. And so if you're watching along at home and you're not joining us live today, take some time to jot this down and see if you can come up with some ideas for these two large general interests, right? Even if this is not your own personal historical interest, I think it's a good exercise to think about how you can connect multiple ideas to the annual theme. So see if you can come up with some ideas for a narrow topic and then some good research questions for each one of these larger general interests. And then we'll be doing this together with everyone in the breakout rooms after the recording. So some guiding questions for youth and junior division students. So is there something that you are learning about in class that you would like to know more about? Let's say you're doing um, world history and you're interested in the one of the early Chinese dynasties. You could totally explore that for your National History Day project. You can pick any topic you like so long as you can convey its connection to the theme and its historical significance. And then once you have an idea for a topic, what other kinds of historical events are happening at the same time as this event that you're researching? And how do they connect, right? Sometimes you'll have events that are happening at the same time that don't really have a connection. And other times we'll have historical events that are happening where they're part and parcel. They're like the same thing. And you need to understand one to understand the other. Are all of the groups that you are looking at on your event or in your topic, are they all working towards the same goal? Do they agree with each other? Do they disagree with each other? Is one group more invested or feels like they have more to lose? Those are all important questions to consider. Did people, did people at the time consider this debate or this diplomatic action a success or did they consider it a failure? And does everyone agree on that, right? So um, maybe if you're looking at the Mexican-American War, right, maybe Americans are like, yeah, this was a great success. But Mexico's like, man, we just lost half of our land mass. This, this did not work out well for us. This was not a diplomatic success. What are the short-term consequences of your, project, or of your historical event? And what are the long-term consequences of your historical event? They're not going to be the same in every circumstance, right? Your short-term consequences, your long-term consequences, not always going to be the same. And then how does this topic apply to the annual theme? And then perhaps even more importantly for a training historian, why is it important? Why does any of this matter? Why should we study the history of the Mexican-American War? Why does it matter? How does it impact us today? So these are some questions to think about for our youth and junior division students. And for our senior division students, I want you to think about all of those other questions, but then I want you to kind of kick it up a notch. So is there something you discussed in class that you'd like to know more about? 
How do other historical events affect the topic that you've chosen? What role do they play? And does the location of the event impact the story, right? Because an event is happening west of the Mississippi, does that change the way that people perceive it? A really good example is um, the Bisbee riots of 1918, for example. This is a really small event, but why is it not included in a larger picture of the Red Summer, for example? In your topic, how do people or groups work together or do they not work together? Uh, do they need to work together? Why do they need to do that? Are the connections between people or groups positive or negative or a mix of both? And does it depend on various circumstances? Do all of these connections include all people or are some people intentionally excluded? Are some people unintentionally excluded? Did people consider this a success or a failure? Does everyone agree with that? And does that change over time? Does everyone get what they want in the end? Why or why not? How does this apply to the theme and why is it important, right? That why is it important question you should always return to because that is the key of history thinking. Why does this matter? How does this impact us today? Why should we care? Don't forget about the graphic organizer that's provided by National History Day to help you get your ideas together. You can find this on their website, nhd.org slash theme, or you can find this under the student tab on the NHDAZ website. Um, this is a fillable PDF document that'll help you kind of think about your ideas and guide your questions as you, as you start picking a topic, writing research questions, and ultimately coming up with that working thesis. So some things to consider. Your teacher might want you to pick a topic based on what you're learning in class. So remember to talk to your teacher. Some of us have absolutely free reign on what we decide we wanna do our topics on, and some of us have to write our papers on the Civil War. That's okay. Um, make sure that you talk to your teacher, read your syllabus if you have one, uh, to get some clarification on what are the parameters of the topic that you can choose. The other thing to consider is that your classroom and National History Day might have different rules. So it is your responsibility as the expert, as the historian, to ensure that your project follows the rules of your classroom and the rules of National History Day. If they are different, for example, your teacher doesn't want an annotated bibliography, you need to make those necessary changes before you submit. And you need to add, in this example, the annotated bibliography. Uh, let's say that your teacher wants you to write an abstract. You don't necessarily have to include an abstract with your National History Day project, so you might want to see that. Or turn it into your process paper. Some final tips. Just start reading. Your project will feel so, so, so awkward at the beginning, and you really won't feel like you have a sense of what you're doing. Just start reading. Embrace the strange. Pick a thread and start following it. If it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine. Change gears. Just get started. That's the best advice that I can give you. Another piece of advice is to think about access to materials. Remember that many archives are only open when you're in school, for example, that some information can't be shared under some circumstances. Let's say that that information is sacred or um, that information, you know, for whatever reason, um, certain groups aren't allowed to read it. You need to respect the rules of the archive. Uh, the other thing is some archives are still closed, right? Not all of the material that you need, you're going to be able to find online. So it's really important for you to creatively problem solve and figure out how to get access to materials. Uh, if you need help accessing materials or you need help getting ideas on how to access materials, reach out to us. We're super happy to help you with that. Um, we've got librarians and historians on staff that are happy to help you with that. Um, so reach out if you need help. And then as always, remember your historical context. History is not one isolated event, but rather a series of events with interesting and sometimes strange connections between them all. Uh, why is this event happening then in the time that it's happening and not 100 years in the past or 100 years in the future? Those are important questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about historical context. All right, if you still need help, send us an email, reach out. You can email us at nhdaz at azhs.org. Um, if you need help picking a theme, finding resources, whatever, 
send us an email if you need help. All right. So our What is History info session is already up on the National History Day in Arizona website under the Students tab. The recording for this session will go up on the website hopefully before the end of next week, although the holiday might change some stuff. So our next session is going to be on September 11th. It's going to be on thesis writing and secondary sources, how to read them, how to find them, what you're supposed to do with them. Um, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, we'll be here. The important thing that I wanted to remind everyone of is if you are a National History Day student, on October 2nd, we're having in-person archives day at the Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe, Arizona History Museum in Tucson, and the Charlotte Hall Museum in Prescott. And I'm going to send all of your teachers a registration form very, very soon. You must register for that event and you must have an appointment. All the sites have different COVID precautions. And once you register, I'll send you an email that's got information, all the stuff that you need to know about whether or not you need to wear a mask or whatever. We'll send you all that information you need to know. You have to register. You have to have an appointment. I cannot say that enough. Um, if for some reason you can't make it or if uh, for some reason the COVID precautions are something that you can't do, we can accommodate you. It will be an online session, um, but we can definitely accommodate you. And that's it uh, for today's workshops. Oh, good luck everyone. If you need additional help, send us an email, reach out. Otherwise, we'll see you next Saturday. Bye. Bye guys.